So let's jump right into the basics of the bandsaw here, which is probably a good thing considering that's the name of the seminar. Um, you can see I've got a couple of different bandsaws here. Uh, I've got the brand new hammer bandsaw here. And it, it's really cool. It's a, uh, a steel frame saw. So it's a lot more rigid than the cast iron ones. I've got an old Delta here too. If you've been to my YouTube channel, you probably saw the video that I made with Alex Snodgrass on rebuilding this whole saw. I mean, really reconditioning it from a, its original state uh, right up until, you know, it's all modernized with Carter guides and a quick release and the whole nine yards there. Check it out on my YouTube channel if you haven't already. The Felder bandsaw, or the Hammer bandsaw, Felder is the parent company of Hammer. And this is a brand new steel frame saw. Like I said, it's a lot more rigid than what you'll find uh, on, a, on the old cast iron types there. Uh, so it can handle uh, resawing a whole lot better with a lot less vibration and a lot less um, movement and stuff. And the really cool thing is right now this saw is on sale for about a thousand bucks. So it's, it's a pretty good deal. Um, it's the first time uh, that I'm aware of that uh, Hammer has introduced something in this size. It's a 14 inch bandsaw. And right now it is fitted with the out, the uh, standard guides that come with it. But I can tell you one of my other sponsors uh, be, beyond Felder for the woodworking shows is Carter Products. And um, they are in the process because this saw is so new. Uh, they're sending me a set of guides that we think will actually work on here. Uh, and hopefully I'll have those set up for uh, next week for the second week in the, uh, the month of woodworking shows. So you'll get to see some of that. So let's talk a little bit about what a bandsaw is and how it works. The concept is pretty simple. And if we look at it historically, the, the precedent for this was basically the handsaw. Um, getting down into bandsaws this size really isn't uh, something that is much more than about a hundred years old, but bandsaws have been around for a very long time. Um, they, they came into existence for processing logs into lumber, uh, really when you think about it. If we look at a bandsaw blade, and I'm gonna grab one here real quick and try and get it sort of on camera here, you can see that it's got a tooth pattern to it, if I can get enough. So if we look at that and compare it to what you would find on a handsaw, that hook pattern, that tooth pattern, um, is really designed to slice through the material. I'm gonna do this real quick. I mean, you can see you know, each tooth, the gullet, and then another tooth. Those things are filed into uh, every bandsaw blade and every handsaw. And in order for those, that material, that, in order for those teeth to rake away the material in a board um, and have the, the blade of the saw pass through the material, uh, we have to add set to the teeth. So what they do is once they file the teeth in there, they then add set to them, which bends them outwards. Okay. The idea is as those teeth rake down through the material, they're creating a path that is wider than the body of the blade. So it's the only way that it, that a, a handsaw works. Um, typically for processing lumber, uh, they would work with a two man saw and they would work, um, it was something called a pit saw. And what they would do is they would dig a trench and then span the trench with a log. And what they would do is one person would be down in the pit, 
pulling on the two-man saw. The other person would be up on the log pulling the, the saw back up. And you can kind of guess that this is where the term the pits came from. Uh, if you're working down in the pit and you're pulling down, you're chewing on a face full of sawdust with every stroke. Um, so they took that basic technology um, of a two-man saw going up and down and uh, applied it to uh, some mechanisms and attached a water wheel to it and now that two-man saw was being operated in an up and down fashion powered by water and all they had to do was create uh, a carriage or a pass uh, passage for the log to move through the moving blade. What they found out was the same thing that you've found out if you've ever used a jigsaw or a saber saw is that that blade only cuts 50% of the time because as it pulls down it makes the cut, you come back up, the teeth are not um, filed in that direction so not much happening up on top and then it's down again. So you have to make twice as many cuts as it takes to get all the way through your board. And at some point they just realized that if they took that saw plate and made it long enough and then welded the ends together, they would get a loop. And at that point they could set it up so that it runs around the two wheels on the saw. They could still attach it to the water wheel so as the water passed by, it turned. Now, as, it tur as the water wheel turns, the both wheels on the bandsaw turn, and we get a continuous cut. And it's always in that down position. And, get rid of that. And much like, and I'm gonna move a camera over here, see if I can't get a little bit of close up on it. So if I pull in tight, you can see the teeth on this blade. They're angled down towards the, the table. And as I turn it, I get a continuous cut as I move my material through. They, just like the table saw, they've added a table to the bandsaw and that allows us to control the force or energy from that downward cut. Okay, so now I can control and get smoother, straighter, more accurate cuts. So if you were in the uh, table saw class earlier, you probably heard the, those three words in combination more than once. Um, and that's the whole idea behind any of the tools that we have. I mean, it, whether it's a handsaw, uh, a table saw, a bandsaw, any of those things, the object is for us to be able to work more accurately, create smoother, straighter cuts. And as we progress through the bandsaw here uh, in the next half hour or so, you're gonna see that I'm gonna mention that a couple of times in a couple of different ways. Uh, so. We have the table on there. It allows us to gain quite a measure of control over uh, all of that energy or that force from the cut so that we can get those smoother, straighter, more accurate cuts. Now, there's two ways to set up any bandsaw. You can set it up for uh, straight cuts or resawing, or you can set it up for scrolling cuts. So this to me is one of the things that makes it uh, one of the five essential machines that I feel if you're starting out in woodworking and you're trying to put together a power tool based shop, uh, a bandsaw is definitely either number one or number two. Uh, most woodworkers today sort of consider that table saw the, the center of uh, the power tool woodworking shop and it has some drawbacks too. I mean there, there's quite a bit of force uh, applied by the spinning circular blade. Potential for kickback is huge on a saw like that. Far, le you know, far less problems with those kind of things here. The band saws 
um, uh, ostensibly it's a uh, it's a safer machine. Um, unfortunately, people really honestly believe that it's a much safer machine, so they tend to be a little bit more cavalier on it. Uh, so they get complacent, and the next thing you know. Um, they have an injury. So we're gonna try and make sure that as I go through all of the different things on these two band saws today, uh, I'm giving you good ideas uh, and tips and, and things like that on how to remain safe on the safest tool in the shop because it quite often becomes the most dangerous tool in the shop. Um, the band saw can do pretty much everything that a table saw can do if it's set up properly. And uh, I mean, the biggest problem you've got is you can't do uh, dados, rabbits, uh, those kinds of things easily. Uh, you know, grooves along the length of a board or something like that are really impossible on a, on a band saw. But if I was just setting up a shop today and I didn't have the budget or the real estate uh, for a big table saw, uh, I would seriously consider um, a band saw as the core of my shop simply because it can rip, it can cross cut, and unlike a table saw, it gives you the ability to do scroll cutting. So um, you get that combination of things it's not ideal for ripping and it's not ideal for cross cutting compared to a table saw um, but it can be accomplished once again probably one of uh, i would say if it isn't number one it's number two on my uh, top five list that top five list in case you're interested would be table saw band saw jointer planer and yes you need both um, and a router once you have those uh, in conjunction with a handful of hand tools and you know all the other clamps and drill bits and things that we have, um, those five power tools, pretty you know stationary power tools, uh, because I would really consider the router mounted in a table as being an essential. Um, you know, once we have those five stationary power tools, a small group of hand hand tools and a small group of handheld power tools really sort of complete your ability to build just about anything you want um, you know regardless of uh, you know your your uh, and it gives you the ability to and it gives you the ability to um, create just a Let's start that whole thing over. So those five stationary power tools, and again, that, that I said a router in there, but I really meant a router table um, because you can use the router mounted in the table or freehand. Um, but mounting it in the table opens up so many more opportunities to you. And we're not gonna go into that. This is a bandsaw basics class. Um, so really what I'm talking about is those five stationary power tools along with all of those basic hand tools that uh, I'm sure you've already got and uh, a couple more uh, handheld power tools gives you the ability to build just about anything you would like. So like I said, for me, I would definitely call the bandsaw, if not my number one, my number two uh, core uh, stationary power tool to purchase because it gives me that option of, uh, I, I use it quite often to straighten the, edge of straighten the edges of lumber that are just too wonky to try and straighten on a joiner. They're crazy to try and um, you know, put that up against the rip fence on a, on a table saw. I can strike a line on there either with a chalk line or a pencil and run up that line on my band saw and then head right over to the joiner and start um, straightening things up easier. Uh, I can cross cut on it and I can scroll cut. So uh, I don't want to waste time showing you how to set up the band saw. What I'm going to tell you is that I 
use the Snodgrass method um, because it works. And if you don't know what the Snodgrass method is, uh, I'll give you a real quick overview of it, but I'm not gonna take a lot of time on it. The best thing to do is go over to the exhibitor side, but not now because you're sitting in my bandsaw class, um, and take a look at the Carter Products booth and the times that Alex is showing you. Uh, it's a free demo on how to set up a bandsaw for both uh, resawing and for scroll cutting. Um, the basic premise is most bandsaws today, let's see if I can rotate this up and back up a little bit. All right, have, you can see this has got a, a curved tire on it. And if I open up the, the hammer saw, you will also see that it too has um, a curved wheel on the top and, and the bottom. The reason for the curved wheel is it helps you center and guide It helps you get the bandsaw blade centered on the wheel properly and helps keep it there. Um, there's a lot of people that say, you know, the first thing you ought to do is check and make sure your two wheels are coplanar. Really, really bad mistake. Um, chances are they are not coplanar. If you really think about it, you have two arched um, tires, wheels on either side. And if you had everything coplanar and you try and get that wheel that bandsaw blade centered on both, um, every time you push in, it, the, the, the bandsaw blade's gonna drop off to the back and every time you pull forward, it's gonna pull f uh, the bandsaw blade forward. By having them slightly out of coplanar, uh, you actually create the ability to track that blade and stop it from just wandering every time you use it. Uh, Alex suggests that we set up the bandsaw with the deepest part of the gullet in the center of that wheel, the center of the crown of that wheel, which to me makes perfect sense because at that point you're controlling that just the edge where the teeth are, you're controlling that part of the blade and the back part of the blade just can fishtail around in the, the kerf any way it pleases. It's not going to turn around and pull your blade in one direction or another. If you have the, the center of the blade on the center of the crown, now you've got that thing just pivoting back and forth. And if you don't have perfectly set teeth on your blade or you knock a few slightly off, um, now your blade is going to create drift or pull to one side. So by keeping that center of the, the deepest part of the gullet in the deepest, right on the crown of those wheels, uh, you, you gain a lot more control over the, the saw itself, uh, the saw blade itself. So I've got this one set up with a Carter stabilizer, which allows me to run a much smaller uh, width blade. So I've got an eighth inch blade in here now. Uh, this blade is actually a quarter inch, which most of the time for most of my career, uh, a quarter inch, either a four or a six tooth blade is what I've uh, had on my, my Delta bandsaw because it gives me the the versatility to do some, uh, some scroll cutting. Most of what I do doesn't go down that small, um, but it also allows me to do some uh, straight line cutting all with that same blade. And that quarter inch blade is about as large as you would want to go if you've got a Car Carter stabilizer on your saw. If you're running um, regular uh, side guides, either Carter or whatever came with the the saw, this originally came with just two steel blocks on the side. Uh, I couldn't get down to the eighth inch blade that I've got on there now because those side guides, uh, there's not enough meat behind the teeth for those uh, side guides to hold on to the saw blade and stop it from twisting as I go through scroll cuts. Uh, about a quarter of an inch is the smallest that I would do. So. Uh, if, if all I have are side guides. 
with the um, with a Carter stabilizer, it, and you can see it's got that little groove in the in the thrust bearing on the back there. It, this blade is sprung so that it always runs in that bearing. Um, you'll see as I as I make a scroll cut here that. I get very little twist and turn out of it. I can make a really small uh, diameter cut because I'm working with an eighth inch blade, which is probably, if I'm gonna keep the stabilizer in the saw all the time, that's the blade that I'm gonna use with it. The quarter inch blade is about as big as I would go with that stabilizer. So let's, uh, let's talk about uh, a little bit of safety here. Obviously all the guards are in place trying to, you know, this area is pretty dangerous because, well, the blade's exposed. Um, you know, the whole point here is to keep your hands, just like with the table saw, keep any part of your body that could come in contact and be uh, cut off by that blade out of the path of the blade. So if I'm going to make a scroll cut here, and I'm just going to take and where did my blue pencil get to so I'm going to make a, a quick scroll cut here I'm going to take my um, just a piece of material and I'm just going to draw a real quick semi curve on here there's okay most beginners on the bandsaw at this point are in a panic because they're thinking like, and now I got to figure out how to, how to handle, and if this board's five feet long, they're, they're really flipping out because it's like, I've got to figure out how to hold that up and, and plan that whole cut all the way through from beginning to end. And the way that I was taught was you don't necessarily approach a curved, line as a whole. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I, I mean I know there's a transition point where I go from convex to concave looking at it from this side. Um, so that creates a natural transition point. But if I just turn around and I break that line up into little like about eighth inch portions here and there's don't measure it just tick it off in whatever you think is an appropriate division, and they don't even have to be perfectly even. But I can turn around and work my way across here. And you can see I got a little bigger down there towards the bottom. I figure by that point I'm going to be experienced enough at cutting this thing that uh, I just don't have to worry about it. I'll, I'll, I'll be able to make it through. So now, instead of having to worry about trying to guide this whole thing, all I need to do is look at each eighth inch segment and line it up with the body of the blade. And now I'm making a whole series of sing singular straight cuts. When I set this up, um, I lowered my guides down and I went about the height of a pencil or about a quarter of an inch from the guide down to the surface of my work material. If I go much higher than that, then I'm not really controlling that blade at the point where it's meeting uh, the material that I'm cutting. So this gives me plenty of room in case like this board has uh, sort of cupped here overnight and you know, now I've got a nice little arch to it, but I don't have to worry about that. I mean, if you've got a piece of wood that cups so bad that it binds on a quarter of an inch of space there, it's time to find a new board. Um, so for me, having that up about a quarter of an inch gives me plenty of space in case there's some variation or if I, if I tend to wobble a little bit, uh, I'm not banging up against or stopping against my guides. And I'll, you'll see, I'll do the same thing when we set up to resaw here in a few minutes. Um, so I've got that set. I've got my table set square. Uh, again, I, I tend to just use a square and butt it up against the side of the body of the blade. I'll raise my guards up and out of the way completely. Um, 
use as big a square as I can get in there because the larger the square, the more accurate, uh, the more accurately you can set up the table relative to that, uh, to the blade. So once I have my height set on my guides and I've got my drawing done, I'm going to throw on my safety glasses and we're going to start this thing. Uh, I will ho hopefully you'll be able to hear me over the saw. So if I just line up that first segment, make a straight cut, adjust, make a straight cut, adjust, straight cut, adjust, and just keep working my way through, You can see I get a nice smooth fared curve out of that because all I'm doing is breaking it down into integral parts. Now you can, you can start out by making them eighth inch segments if you like uh, and then continually increase that and you'll, you'll slowly get the feel of it if you're just starting out. Um, the other thing you saw, you saw as I was doing this, I kept my fingers completely out of the path of the blade the entire time. Uh, the vast majority of accidents that I've seen and heard about on the bandsaw occur because people are cutting along with something and they're pushing where they, where in front of where they are the blade and they hit a punky spot the material, you know, particularly if you're ripping, um, there's a little bit of tension on that material and it pushes, splits apart. And the next thing you know, your finger goes into, and most likely your thumb, because that's the way a lot of people um, push on the bandsaw is with that thumb hooked around the, the trailing edge. Um, so lots of thumb accidents on the bandsaw. Um, and remember, if you cut it off, that is the thing that it, um, separates us from the other animals is the opposable thumbs. Um, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, your fingers, your thumbs, everything is out of the path of that. Kind of like I talked about in the table saw class. If you keep your body parts out of the path of the blade and out of the path of the wood, uh, you're, you're greatly reducing your risk uh, of, of injury right away. So, the other thing that letting this, uh, keeping the, the guide down at about a quarter of an inch above the material does, it, you can see I've got a little bit of wobble on this. The, the, it's pulling off on the end there and lifting up. Uh, that was the other thing that I wanted to show you is I tried to keep the material held down tight to the table. All of the force from this cut on this blade is down towards that table. So if I start with the material up in the air, when I cut with it, it's going to drag it straight down. Essentially, it's the bandsaw's version of a kickback. Uh, we end up with the inability to control the cut all that well because it slams that material down into the table. And quite often there's a ricochet effect and it starts bouncing around. Version of a kickback. Uh, we end up with the inability to control the cut all that well because it slams that material down into the table and quite often there's a ricochet effect and it starts bouncing around version of a kickback. Uh, we end up with the inability to control the cut
all that well because it slams that material down into the table and quite often there's a ricochet effect and it starts bouncing around a version of a kickback uh, we end up with the inability to control the cut all that well because it slams that material down into the table and quite often there's a ricochet effect and it starts bouncing around a version of a kickback uh, we end up with the inability to the cut as it slams that material down into the table and quite often there's a ricochet effect and it starts bouncing around uh, we end up with the inability to control the cut as it slams that material down into the table and quite often there's a ricochet effect and it starts bouncing around uh, we end up with the inability to control the cut as it slams that material down into the table and quite often there's a ricochet effect and it starts bouncing around uh, we end up with the inability to control the cut as it slams that material down into the table and quite often there's a ricochet effect and it starts bouncing around with the inability to control the cut as it slams that material down into the table and quite often there's a ricochet effect and it starts bouncing around with the inability to control the cut as it slams that material down into the table and quite often there's a ricochet effect and it starts bouncing around with the inability to control the cut as it slams that material down into the table and quite often there's a ricochet effect and it starts bouncing around with the inability to control the cut If I just start to turn, you can see I'm flexing that blade out at an angle, okay? While you can get away with a little bit of that sort of wiggling and wobbling the blade back and forth, uh, you really don't want to spend a whole lot of time uh, over on an angle like this because now the blade is not tracking in the direction you want to go and you also have the, the possibility that you'll jump out of the guide groove uh, in the stabilizer which obviously has happened here a couple of times in a class in the classes that I teach because somebody's worn a nice little groove uh, in the upper part of the stabilizer and if you're using um, standard uh, gu side guide blocks on there uh, by continually really twisting that you're building up an awful lot of friction and heat on the blade and you got to remember that when they set those teeth, uh, they hardened everything afterwards. And when you uh, essentially anneal the blade again, it's going to it has memory. It's going to want to go back to its original position. So it's if you get the blade warm enough, uh, you'll start to lose set. And if you have side guides on there, uh, by twisting it that much, you actually could um, physically you make contact with the teeth and the side guides and knock the, uh, the set out of the teeth altogether. So that gives you a pretty good idea on uh, some safety tips and some ideas of what's going on when we do scroll cuts. Uh, let's take a look at um, the bandsaw that I have set up to do some resawing. Once again, I'm gonna grab my camera here and show you again i'm set up using the alex snodgrass method of trying to keep that blade centered on there uh, let me show you the upper guides on here these are the standard guides that come on this saw um, as i said uh, carter is sending me some guides for this saw that I should have set up for the second week in the month of woodworking shows. So I've got my two side bearings um, on there. There's a little bit of space in between them. I have a little bit of room behind my uh, bandsaw blade here back to the thrust bearing and you've got pretty much the same assembly above and below. Um, just the tiniest little bit of pressure on the on the back of that finger really sort of makes it um, come in contact with that thrust bearing. It's not on it all the time. Um, 
And again, these are the uh, stock bearings that come from, we're getting set up with both companies so that Carter can provide uh, not only me, but uh, those who own the hammer bandsaw, uh, a set of Carter uh, upper and lower guides. Uh, and I'm not sure whether that is going to be solely available through Carter or if it is also something, an, op an option that um, Felder might offer uh, if you were to purchase um, this bandsaw through them. So uh, I've got everything set up ready to uh, resaw. We're going to resaw a little piece of curly maple here, uh, give you some tips on that whole process as well. Mostly safety stuff. Let's close up the saw. Start with the front guide. The upper and lower doors on this move in unison. Uh, you can lock, you have to lo lock or unlock both uh, the upper and lower doors in order to be able to swing it open. They're connected by uh, a blade guard over here. That's one of the things that I really like about the saw is that at no point is, other than where you're cutting, is the blade exposed. I'm gonna set up the saw pretty much the same way that I did for the scroll cuts. Uh, I'm gonna bring the material in. And uh, in this case, the guides are a little above uh, this guard on the front of the blade. So I wanna make sure that I've got about a quarter of an inch. I could go up just a tiny bit. Unlock. And again, it doesn't have to be exact as long as you have some kind of um, space in there in case your material varies in width or has a bow to it or something. Um, so I've got that set up. Another really good feature that I like on here is this little lens on the front which allows you to see uh, the line that you're cutting no matter uh, how much uh, how wide the material is. Uh, if this, I had this set up for scroll cutting, uh, I'd still be able to see my line. So if I just take and mark the center of my three quarter inch board, uh, I can now either use that or uh, I really like these fasts. Um, if I just take the a three eighth inch fast, I'm going to resaw this in half and lay it down in there up against the, the blade. I must have something not quite set where it ought to be because it was at an angle. And that's why, because my, my fence is not, is rotating and not perfectly flush. There we go. All right. So I get that lined up. And what you're going to see when I cut this is that I get a, an absolutely dead straight I mean laser straight kind of a cut out of this and that has nothing to do with the bearings uh, with the guide bearings or any of that stuff it has to do with making sure that center of the deepest part of the gullet is on that um, the crown of the 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 wheel on the top wheel there and then setting up your your guide bearings no matter what kind you have um, so that it allows that uh, the blade the uh, cut freely through there. The side bearings on this are set below the gullet, the deepest part of the gullet on here, um, by slightly more than the distance uh, from my thrust bearing to the back of the blade. And what that does is it allows me to push in uh, and not make contact with the set on the teeth with those side bearings. So let me show you how this works and I'm gonna give you a couple of safety tips as we go. If I was cutting a first safety tip, if I was cutting a really long board, say six feet, I was gonna resaw that. I would set up some kind of a dead man on the, uh, the front and the back of the saw to help me balance that material and stop it from dropping either as I feed it in or as I feed it out. Okay, I want it to follow th through smoothly. Those, um, those roller dead men that I have uh, around the shop that you, know, they, you, can, you find them everywhere. Uh, you can re set those heights up so that they're exactly the height of your bandsaw table. Um, and 
but this is only a couple of feet long so I think I can pretty much handle it on my own without the uh, the use of a dead man so I've got I want to make sure that I feed in straight because once again the all of the force from the cut on this blade is down so if I start out by coming in at an angle uh, where this back end is dropping down it's going to slam it down into the table and I lose control of the cut and that's really the whole purpose of any of these machines the table saw the bandsaw the joiner the planer all of those things are to give us control over the cut which makes it possible for us to get smoother straighter more accurate cuts so let's give this one a shot here I'm gonna throw on my safety glasses start up the machine I'm gonna move over to the side I'm gonna change my position of my camera Keep that material uh, nice and level on the table. Nice steady feed rate, not too fast, not too slow. And as you can see, I've got a really nice straight veneer off of there. Yup, three-eighths of an inch is a veneer. Uh, the other thing I want you to notice that I did as I went along there, uh, I kept my right hand in front of the blade and kept that pressure against the fence. Uh, once I got to the point where I was running, running out of table, I went to a a push stick which I just happened to have a scrap around uh, I angled that scrap I put it down on the table number one uh, because once again if I try and push it up here when it makes contact with the blade it's going to get slammed down into the table pretty quickly put it down on the table and angled it towards the fence to push it in and then what I did was I sort of crept my way over and held up the back edge so that I was supporting that length and finished off my cut. I didn't want the material to drop off on the back because then that's going to set up that sort of bouncing and stuff like that. Uh, I don't, this, this bandsaw blade, this bandsaw blade is, uh, this bandsaw has been in the uh, Felder showroom for the last few months and I don't know what bandsaw blade has been on it. Uh, or, well, I don't know who makes the bandsaw blade that's on it, and I don't uh, know who has been using it or whatever. I mean, this is not the ultimate smoothness in a resaw cut. 
um, but it is nice and straight. So uh, I, I can tell you the, the blade, I'm not sure again who made it or what, who's been using it and, and how or abusing it really. Uh, my, my preferred blade for resawing at this point is I'm uh, super fond of those uh, 3 8 inch Greenwood blades by Carter. They have totally revolutionized the, uh, uh, that whole resawing aspect of the bandsaw for me. I, I really like how uh, the surface that it leaves and that stuff is dead straight when it comes off of there. You can't really cut curves with it. You'll just destroy the blade. Um, so the only, when I throw the uh, Carter blade on for resawing onto my Delta saw, uh, I've got a couple of band saws here in the shop. I have another that I use almost exclusively for resawing. And it has uh, the 3 8 inch Carter blades on it all the time. Uh, this saw, we're getting some 3 8 inch blades in for, for next week uh, so that I can, as I make up my jigs, my essential jigs here, uh, you'll see that um, it'll actually improve the quality of the cut on here a good bit. Keep that pressure on with uh, that right hand as I'm feeding it in. I did not put the pressure on, on the back side of the fence simply because, um, just like on the table saw, if I push on the back side of that uh, fence, I'm gonna squash that material together and start binding on the blade. Binding creates that friction, which uh, shortens the life of a bandsaw blade uh, in the end. The other thing I want you to notice is that the fence on this hammer saw does not go the full depth of the table, okay? It, it, it's a short fence. You don't need to have a fence that sticks way out the back of this table. Once I need all of that precision up front as I'm feeding the material in, uh, that backside, as long as it extends even a little bit past the blade, just like on the table saw, I, I, just, I wanna get past the backside of the blade with my material and then I'm done because every, the cut's over. So, um, I actually have this one adjusted pretty far forward. Uh, I could have I could have brought it in, you know, all the way back to this point where, you know, literally just as the material exit exits the blade, it's got about another inch beyond in the back. Um, so don't get freaked out if you get a bandsaw and it has a short fence on there. It doesn't have to go all the way to the back side. Um, once it gets once the material gets past the teeth, it's no longer cutting. So. Um, so keep your, keep your push stick close at hand, keep it down on the table, put all your, your uh, material, make sure that it's running level with the, um, with the table itself. Uh, it doesn't want to drop either coming in on the infeed side or the outfeed side. Uh, when you do that, that's when you start to have the problems with, uh, that material grabbing and slamming down to the table. Set up your bandsaw blades with the snodgrass method and um, you know keep your hands out of the path of the of the saw itself and you're probably in pretty good position using a bandsaw. So at this point I'm gonna wrap this up. I will uh, take any questions that you guys have. Uh, just throw them up there in the chat. I've been trying to cover those as we've gone through um, using these things anyway. But if you have any additional questions, that'd be great. If, uh, if you're heading off to another seminar, that's awesome too. Make sure you come back next week when I show you um, my essential bandsaw jigs and fixtures, which will help you get more out of your bandsaw than you're probably getting right now. So. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.